In today's episode, we take to the North Coast 500 for the first time, find a way to explore a place called Anthrax Island, and offer a tour of our Vauxhall VX220. Enjoy. Hard at work, packing the bag on Wednesday morning. How are you feeling this morning? Uh, pretty good, refreshed. Um, the midges have come out overnight, so I feel a bit paranoid like I'm getting bitten everywhere. But um, apart from that, I'm very keen to crack on and check out the North Coast 500. The day was all about the North Coast 500 and we were going to be driving the best it had to offer, the west coast of Scotland. Having stayed on Sky the night before, we were poised to join the now famous route after a short 20 mile stretch. That stretch was lengthened slightly by Richard having to take care of a phone call as well as other business. However, soon we were back on the road and close to what we came for. Okay, half a mile to go and then we're officially turning onto the North Coast 500. At that point we'll be heading towards Apple Cross with some pretty healthy climbs to come. After stopping for a cold drink and to do some car spotting at the Apple Cross Inn, we filled up our VX at the community owned petrol pump and carried on. It's easy to get carried away when driving the North Coast 500. The roads are so beautiful that hours in the car seem like minutes. But there's something else that will compete for your attention too. The cars. No car is too special for a road like the North Coast 500. We saw Ferraris, Porsches, Bentleys, Lotuses of all varieties, Audi R8s, Mazda MX-5s and tons more. We saw special at every price point, all sharing and enjoying the same stretch of tarmac. After a while we got stuck behind a convoy of said special cars. Passing was out of the question on the single track roads, so instead we decided to stop again, at which point we found another. Slight design flaw on the VX220, which only shows its head after extended spirited driving. So we've just stopped on our route up the North Coast 500 for a break, bit of shade, just to get a bit of relaxation, maybe get a bit of food in us. It's hot and the car's running hot, it's fine, but I want to show you what happens when these cars do get a bit hot. Come and have a look. So you're stopping to grab something out of the boot after a pretty hard drive. Engine's been running really hot. Open it up, grab this little st stick, and it's absolutely boiling hot. And not only that, when you lower it on, 
it flexes no end. Usually, that's straight as a die. I've got to correct myself here, the support rod is not usually dead straight and always flexes a little under the weight of the boot lid, whether hot or cold. However, I have tested the support rod under different temperatures and I can confirm it definitely does feel considerably weaker when the engine's been working hard beside it. When hot, you definitely need to be light-handed when using it. And I don't believe for even a moment that it would be capable of supporting the weight of a boot rack, even an unladen one. I can see it. So what's happened, Graham? Activity time. Um, I remember when I was packing the car, and telling people how this seat doesn't move back and forth and how it's not that much of a problem. Massive problem. So rubbish. So, because it's so low slung, stuff just flies out your pockets, goes under the seat, and there's just no way of getting anything because it's got this lip from the chassis under here and I can't fit my hand here and it's too narrow to fit. So I've lost my phone, which is all our directions. I've also got a drone battery under there, but I've just, that's redundant until we can get the seat out after, at the end of this trip. So, um, I'm actually not sure how this is going to be done. But, uh, oh wait, no, I've got it. Got it. Easy. Boom, so easy. It's not like I've been trying to do that for the last 45 minutes while we've been on our way. Right, I'm ready. Okay, look, yeah, I can see here. This is as close as we can get to where we want to see. Right. I think we're going to need a cookie. I was going to say a new drone battery. We're going to fly the drone over to there. This island's about a kilometre away. Okay. I need you to fly it there. Actually, you know what? Whilst he's flying over there, I'm gonna go onto the whiteboard, show this off, and just keep that footage in the background. Here's the story of the Anthrax Island in four minutes. Grignard Island is also known as Anthrax Island for obvious reasons. So during the Second World War, whilst each country was bombing the other, the British government became aware that they were surviving the Blitz. This worried them as they thought the Germans may up their game and turn to chemical warfare. So the Brits decided to get ahead. They wanted a chemical weapon of their own and the obvious chemical to use was anthrax. It's silent and can kill from skin contact, inhalation and ingestion. They went ahead and made a series of bombs, not to immediately use against the enemy, but to first test on home soil. You only need one guess where they tested it. They claimed the island from its owner on the grounds that it was required for military use and then, in great secrecy, transported 80 sheep to the island and detonated a bomb on a breezy day so that the chemicals would drift over to the animals. Super barbaric and highly effective and fortunately not necessary as anthrax was never used during the war. But the story of Grignard Island actually continues because when the war ended in 1945, the owner of the island came to the government and asked to have their land back. And the government had to say, sorry, no, we've kind of infected the whole place and no one can step foot on it for at least 50 years. They did however promise that, when the island was no longer just a large slab of killer chemicals, the government would sell the islands back to the owner, or the owner's heir, for the sum of £500. As the years went on, people were getting pretty annoyed about the state of Grignard Island. There were means of disinfecting the island, but the government didn't want to spend the money cleaning up the mess they'd made. Eventually, in the 1980s, a small group of people acted. In what was called Operation Dark Harvest, a team took a boat over to the island and collected samples of the contaminated soil. They sent a sample to a military lab, who confirmed it was indeed anthrax tainted soil and the group then threatened to send it elsewhere where it could infect people unless the government gets on and decontaminates the island. They even sent a box of soil to a political party conference in Blackpool 
It was just regular soil, not contaminated, but it scared the politicians into action, and in 1986 the government began a full-scale decontamination of the islands. In 1990, Grignard Island was finally deemed safe, and it was purchased back by the original owner's heirs for the agreed sum of £500. Whilst people have walked on the island since, others still don't believe it to be safe. Regardless of whether it is or isn't, with a nickname like Anthrax Island, Grignard Island is likely never going to be a teeming tourist destination, and currently, the best way to see it may still be on the side of a road on the North Coast 500. Okay, so yesterday we told you about the things that we maybe don't like about the car so much. Now let us show you what we do like about the car. Okay, first thing first. Ah, Smooth. But that's exactly what I was talking about yesterday. It's because you're lame though. It's not because I'm lame. It's not, look. Oh, okay, work that time, whatever. First thing, the wheel. Momo steering wheel, and it's small which makes it such a good steering wheel for driving with, in my opinion. It fits so nicely in the hands. It feels kind of like an early 1990s Formula One car steering wheel. And that is absolutely fine by me. Makes for a wonderful driving experience. Right, next. It's these things. These are made from extruded aluminium. Very, very Lotus. Back when Lotus were making the Series 1 Elise and they discovered how good extruded aluminium works, they got incredibly overexcited and started extruding as much as they could. This carried on to the Vauxhall VX220 and these window winders are wonderfully engineered and just look great in my opinion. So great feature. Number three, going from here, it's gotta be the starter button. Not much more needs to be said, they're awesome. Whilst we're in the cabin, just have a look. It's incredibly spartan. You've got such few buttons on offer in front of you. You've got the radio and CD player, and three heater knobs, and that's it, covering all of this dashboard. Otherwise here you've got the VX220 plaque, by the way I should say here, excuse the carbon wrap, that was done by a previous owner and we haven't got round to removing it yet. Something else that was added by a previous owner are these things, here. ATS DTC 17 inch alloy wheels. Aftermarket of course, but a really good addition to any Vauxhall VX220. That's because when Vauxhall released the VX220, it came with pretty heavy 17 inch wheels all round. The front alloys weighed 9.8 kilograms each and the rears weighed 11.6 kilograms each. That's considerably heavier than what Lotus were offering with the Elise. These wheels remove about two kilograms per corner on the car. So it's a great, great improvement. And of course that's all unsprung weight, which is fantastic for cornering performance. Right. What next? Um, shall we have a look at the front bonnet? Yes. People might be wondering what's under here. Is it a boot? Is there loads of storage space in there? Why haven't we been using it then? As you can see, basically, no room for any extra storage. No, uh, you've got your spare wheel um, in form of a can. Your battery is located under the windscreen washer uh, reservoir. Um, and then you've got a pretty huge uh, radiator there. One thing this car has got over the Elise is this little box right here. That's ABS. So this car's only got two channel ABS. Correct. Which can be a bit problematic. If you're going to track these cars, it's highly recommended that you either switch it off or get it upgraded to four channel ABS. That's because when the brakes start to overheat, the ABS system can be triggered. Yeah, so basically when tracking, it can be unpredictable. Highly unpredictable and pretty damn dangerous. So that's basically all there is to show under there. Yes, another post-factory thing done to this car, something you may have noticed already, and to some it's definitely gonna be sacrilege, especially as the cars are getting more and more popular and more and more acceptable as a Vauxhall. It's the lack of vo- What I of course was about to say was the lack of any Vauxhall badges on the exterior of the car. However, as the words were about to leave my mouth, 
the cast of a knockoff Mad Max movie turned up to share our parking spot, and therefore we were forced to move on. But I'm going to quickly mention just a few other things about this car. The passenger side footrest. It's stylish, aluminium, and was an optional extra. Also, it's surprisingly useful for bracing against when the car is being driven spiritedly. Next, the sills. They're wide, they're yellow, and they can't have any weight put on them because they're made of fiberglass. This does make getting in and out of the car a little precarious. However, it's easier when you remember that the black plastic things next to the sill can take all the weight in the world as they're covering nothing but the chassis. The cut here is what makes the VX220 and the Elise S2 chassis different to that of the Elise S1. Lotus shaved 50mm of the height of the tub on the second generation chassis to make getting in and out of the car easier, and they supposedly managed it without sacrificing any torsional rigidity. The final thing I'm going to mention are the leather seats, because leather seats were actually an optional extra on the VX220. However, it was such a popular one, you'll find that leather seats are far more common than the standard fabric ones. After giving a brief tour of our car, the plan was to put in some serious miles and then find a campsite, as the afternoon was already turning into evening. Here's another thing about the North Coast 500 though. There are awesome distractions everywhere. Whoa! Castle! I think we can actually get to that. This is Ardvrek Castle. It's been standing for over 500 years. It was partially demolished around 250 years ago because the stone was needed to build a school, and it is surrounded by beauty. Cool. This is one of the cool things about Scotland. Just like this. Castles, yeah. yeah, and it's just about. You just pass it on the road and it's like, oh, should we stop there? Yeah, why not? And then we just walk straight up to it. No entrance fees, no one with the gate trying to grab money from you. You just walk in and have a peruse. Cool, let's rock and roll because we really need to follow cups though. Yeah. So we left the castle about 10 minutes ago or something like that. And we're having a look and we can't really find a campsite anywhere to stop. You know, checking on Google Maps and things like that and there's nothing nearby at all. Yeah, it's, um, it's not a big problem because what we've realised is it's lovely driving in the day but at night the roads seem way more clear. Um, so it's actually really nice to get some good kind of continuous driving without starting stopping for the traffic or getting stuck behind something particularly slow. This is our big tip for those driving the North Coast 500. If you're wanting to put your foot down a bit, you'll be after clear roads. And if you're after clear roads, drive into the evening. Yes, you won't get as much time at the pub, but you'll be getting the best driving experience you possibly can on some of the best roads in the UK. The long summer days meant that visibility was still great, yet we barely encountered a car. It was the most fun driving we'd had all day, 
and that's saying something. And in the clear air, we covered vastly more miles than we thought we could, which was a good thing, as eventually all the miles we managed to put in paid dividends when we stumbled across a potential campsite. It's about half eight, sun's about to set, and we think we've just found what we're looking for. So we've just entered a place called Scowry, and not on Google Maps or anything like that, but it just says Scowry campsite ahead. So we're hoping that they've got space for us and there's a pub local which we're going to keep our eyes peeled for. This could be good news. I mean, it could be a disaster, but... Well, otherwise we're wild camping, which... We've got no toilet we're... paper. Oh, yes. We've got camper vans and cafe bar. Open daily, hopefully. Open daily, hopefully Real open nightly. Cafe right, let's pull in here. Right. I presume. What does it say? On your own. Please find the pitch and come back to reception at 9 a.m. Sweet. Cool. Let's just do that. That should be good. Thanks for watching episode 5. Tune in tomorrow when we discuss our driving impressions of the Vauxhall VX220, find out about the Scottish lie that surrounds the pneumatic tyre and test what is perhaps one of the UK's greatest driving roads. In the meantime, please do consider subscribing to my channel should you want to be kept up to date with my newest videos. Thanks.